I didn't think about it for a long time until Eric and I would get together and we would share what was happening in the family, and uh, we had to make a decision. Almost had no choice to do what I did, and I hate myself for doing it. Welcome to How It Really Happened. I'm Hill Harper. The Menendez murders are one of the most well-known crimes in U.S. history. Jose, a wealthy Hollywood executive, and his wife Kitty gunned down in their Beverly Hills mansion. For months, the case went unsolved until the shocking confessions of their sons, Lyle and Eric, came to light. When the case went to trial in July 1993, nearly four years after the crimes, the public was literally watching along gavel to gavel on an up-and-coming cable network. Court TV. The Menendez brothers became infamous pop culture celebrities, not just for killing their parents, but for the reasons they claim drove them to do so. Their riveting testimony is next. Check it out. The press calls the case the Beverly Hills Mansion Murders, and the story reads like one of the unsold scripts that circulate here in Hollywood. What's the problem? I'm sorry to kill my parents. Are these the words of a saddened, shocked son, or the cool words of a cold-hearted killer? Prosecutors contend the Menendez brothers were hoping to collect on an inheritance estimated at $14 million. They were spending quite a bit of money on lavish items. Some estimates say that in the first six or seven months after the deaths, they spent a million dollars. They were spending money like they were drunken sailors. And now Lyle and Eric Menendez face the death penalty, first degree murder. Greedy rich kids kill Ozzy and Harriet on a Sunday night in Beverly Hills. And there's much more to this story than that. The courtroom at the LA Superior Courthouse in Van Nuys was actually a very tiny courtroom. And so there were a dozen uh, media people that got to see the trial in the courtroom every day. Writer Dominic Dunn appeared to hear opening statements. There's a writer here. I had just gotten out of school and started as a cub reporter at this legal newspaper. I got one of the seats in the courtroom. There were the lawyers and the brothers. My editors and I knew from the get-go that it was going to be captivating as hell. Okay, uh, now opening statements by the prosecution. Thank you, Anna, and good morning. The only time I've ever thrown up during a trial was right before opening statement. Based upon this evidence, it will become apparent that this murder was unlawful, unjustified, and wholly premeditated. I had been told by the DA's office to acquiesce to cameras on the courtroom. And I went in chambers with the other attorneys, and I said, absolutely not. I do not want cameras in the courtroom. And the judge said, we are not going to have cameras. And we come in for opening statement, and there's the goddamn camera. But for a few mistakes they made, this was almost the perfect murder. It's very Thank difficult you. now, 20 plus years later, to think about how, if the right word is innovative, the Menendez trial was. A Los Angeles courtroom has become the focus of worldwide media attention. People were not used to seeing courtroom drama on television. They just were not. For many television viewers, cameras in court have gone from novelty to necessity. When you see it on TV, you feel like you're there and you kind of get to be a judge yourself. It's real life, and I think that all of us like to delve into other people's lives. People could not get enough of this. The high-profile case of the two brothers accused of shooting their parents to death in their Beverly Hills mansion has captured the interest of people across the country. But some interest has little to do with legal issues. I think they're really cute. <laughs> At the height of their popularity, which is kind of a funny word to use, Eric and Lyle Menendez were reading a thousand letters a week, uh, primarily from women uh, all over the world who were sending them uh, naked pictures, uh, telling them that they wanted to come visit them at the LA County Jail. A combination of infamy and popularity. Prosecutor Bozanich throughout the trial has maintained the brothers actually killed their parents out of greed and hate. My premise was they killed their parents because the parents were about to disinherit them and the parents were fed up with them. So the prosecution's case was actually straightforward. The, the, everything showed that, that Lyle and Eric Menendez had in fact shotgunned their parents to death. The prosecution's star witness was Dr. Jerome Ozeal, 
He was their therapist, and he was the person who the brothers had confessed to. We did it. Um, and, and we said I, we killed our parents. I didn't believe they were, they were guilty. I just couldn't fathom that they could have done that. I never believed whatsoever until it came out at trial. The defense may call its next witness. Defense calls Joseph Lyle Menendez. Lyle was the first one to take the stand. Even just hearing his voice was dramatic for everyone because it's very rare that you get to hear from the mouth of someone who has committed a murder exactly how that murder went down. We just burst through the doors and uh, I started firing. They sat there very matter-of-factly and explained that they did it. I entered the room. I saw two people in the room, and I just started firing. Oh, my gosh. I mean, how many people would do that? I just fired until there was nothing left. There was things shattering, and the noise was phenomenal, just chaos. The most dramatic piece of evidence was when Lyle Menendez acknowledged that, yes, he had reloaded his shotgun and taken it and put it up against his mother's head and fired. At some point, was your gun empty? Yes. So I reloaded. And what did you do after you reloaded? <laughs> I ran around and shot my mom. And then Kitty gets shot and is crawling along the floor, trying to, you know, get out of the way. Murdering her, shooting her like a dog, and then running through all that money on frivolities. Did they ever even love her? I felt very betrayed and used, especially with the whole phenomena of coaching them after the fact. And uh, that's when I really withdrew. The prosecution put, put on a strong case, but what they were counting on was the power of the defense. I just told him, I don't, I don't. And now we had an explanation. Over the past four weeks, prosecutors have tried to prove that the two Menendez brothers coldly plotted and carried out the execution of their parents for two reasons, hatred and greed. And defense lawyers concede that their clients did kill their parents, but not for those reasons. We're back and we welcome Leslie Abramson, the attorney for Eric Menendez. She's regarded in Los Angeles and around the country as one of the best defense attorneys in the business. If I was in trouble, I would think very seriously about calling Leslie Abramson because she is that good. This case has been treated like a soap opera by you all for a long time. And it isn't a soap opera. This is real life. Leslie Abramson was incredibly passionate. She was almost like rebellious in the courtroom. I'm going to this. object to that answer, Your Honor. This witness has been trying to do Counsel, this. Counsel, if you will succeed in not mugging for the jury, not making faces to the audience, you will behave professionally. Is that clear? Yes, of course. I do not believe any jury will ever convict Eric Menendez of first-degree murder. Leslie, you know, dressed them up in sweaters in court and tried to tried to emphasize how young they were. I remember watching her in court, how she would put her arm around them and rub them and pat them, like pick a piece of lint off their sweater and smooth it down in front of the jury. Who could, you know, harm their parents, you know, looking like that? During their trial, the brothers admitted they shot and killed film company executive Jose Menendez and his wife Kitty in the den of their $4 million Beverly Hills home because, they said, of a dark family secret. So in this case, the brothers had confessed. They had said that they killed their parents. They said it in the confession, the doctor. They also said it on the stand. So then this case went from a who done it to why had they done it. Both brothers were calling me occasionally from jail. They said, wait until the trial. You'll find out what was really happening in the Menendez family. I had done many cases for Leslie Abramson over the years, and she could not believe this horrific killing was merely the product of them wanting money. So she brought me in as her psychiatric expert, and she said, look, I want you to interview these boys 
and find out really what went on. Lyle proved to be a very, very difficult interview subject. And he was very reluctant to talk about virtually anything. Whereas Eric, all he would kept telling me was how wonderful his father was and that his mother was such a wonderful, loving mother. I really wasn't getting anywhere. It wasn't until four months, little dribs and drabs started to come out that there had been some very negative things going on in the family. And now we had an explanation. For 12 years, between the ages of six and 18, my client, Eric Menendez, was sexually molested by his father. The attorneys stand up and they say they killed the parents because of abuse, and you could hear a pin drop. And we were all like, oh. People started saying, why are we just hearing about this for the first time? Jose Menendez's obvious purpose was to use his child's body to satisfy his lust. I had no idea of that. The boys had never spoken about that. And, or anybody that I knew around them had never spoken about that. I never saw anything with Jose and the boys at all. Between the ages of six and eight, did your father have sexual contact with you? Yes. Everyone in the courtroom was stunned. People just writing as fast as they could, trying to get every word. My dad came in and told me to take off my clothes and uh, to kneel on the bed. At one point, I just started screaming, and I started saying, stop, it hurts, it hurts. I think people were stunned not only to hear this claim in the first place, but to hear the details about what these brothers said happened to them. It frightened me. Did you cry? Yes. Did you ask him not to? Yes. How did you ask him not to? I just told him, I don't, I don't. <laughs> I just told him that I didn't want to do this and that it hurt me. And he said that he didn't mean to hurt me. And he loved me. I saw reporters uh, that were crying. It was just such a powerful moment. Uh, probably one of the most powerful moments I've ever seen in a courtroom. They had two years to get ready for their testimony. I happen to know the defense attorneys were at the county jail almost every day. So, you know, put two and two together, they're practicing. I thought the defense case was original, creative, a fascinating piece of defense lawyering and absolute nonsense. Assistant District Attorney Pam Bazanich calls the brothers' abuse defense a legal smokescreen. I would bet everything I own and everything everybody else owns that it didn't happen. I was told by the bailiffs that he and Eric would high-five each other after their testimony because they, you know, they did such a great job. I think the prosecution was confident of their case. Um, I think they thought that uh, the jury is not going to buy this defense, and so I don't think they, um, they really prepared um, a significant response. You learned to lie as a child, didn't you? I would, I would say I did. If you lied about this for all those months, how are we supposed to know that you're now telling the truth? They were all screwed up, psychologically basket cases, that there's a reason why they acted out against their parents. Something didn't sit right with me. Something was wrong. Court TV records viewer comments, and since the trial began five months ago, the line is often clogged with callers interested in the Menendez case. It's hard to describe how I felt, like I had to run as fast as I could, but my life was sort of slipping away, and that we were going to die. So this was before social media. You can imagine if, if Twitter was a thing during the Menendez trial, it, it would have blown up. And just who's calling? Men and women on both sides of the case, those who believe the brothers are innocent. They're calling in to say, uh, you know, give these guys more credit. They can't make up, you can't make up stuff like this. And those who find them guilty. Those kids are absolute lying brats, a string of four letter words. Even the prosecutor's office gets up to 50 calls a day. You've got people calling you from Arkansas saying, I saw you on court TV and I really hate your hair. And it's like, thank you, ma'am, but you know, I'm a little busy right now. Um, and that happened a lot. 
The defendants told Dr. Ozeal that they killed their father because he controlled them and made them feel inferior. There were people not only in the States, but all over the world that were watching every day like a soap opera. Jose Menendez's obvious purpose was to use his child's body to satisfy his lust. And uh, people that uh, had to work during the day would record it and watch it at night. And Court TV would run a three-hour highlight show every night. I'm telling the truth to, to the best that I can. And I remember firing directly at him. Can you answer the question? Yes. Okay, it was you telling Lyle what? That my dad had been molesting me. People were obsessed. People couldn't get enough. I remember one of the Court TV employees saying that uh, NBC had called and they were going to do a skit about the Menendez brothers on Saturday Night Live. And it was about Eric and Lyle on the stand and supposedly blaming everything on their younger twin brothers that apparently nobody knew anything about. Is it your testimony that you and your brother Eric, in fact, had nothing to do with the murder of your parents, Jose and Kitty Menendez? That's correct. Then can you tell the court who did murder your parents? Our other two brothers, Danny Menendez and Jose Menendez Jr. You could see the celebrity aspect of this trial playing out in real time and in real life, and the zaniness of some of the people who were involved. Dr. Jerry Ozeal is quite a character. He was almost worthless, except he could say, they told me they did it. I asked him, you, you mean you killed your parents? He said yes. And then Judalon Smith, his girlfriend, was bat crazy. Are you aware of the fact that you told Diane Sawyer the following things? She asked you, in the program which was aired on August the 30th of 1990, are Lyle and Eric Menendez guilty? Did they murder their parents? Your answer, yes, they did. Diane Sawyer, you know this. You answered, absolutely. I heard from their own mouths that they killed their parents. So now you're saying that you no longer believe that you heard that, correct? I was brainwashed. You were brainwashed? I mean, who brainwashed her? How could she be brainwashed? How could she tell Diane Sawyer one thing so clearly and then in court decide to completely, you know, renege on that story. I think when Dr. Ozeal's girlfriend was on the stand, you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, what a, what a show. I always wanted to try a complex murder. It turns out that you have to be careful what you wish for. This was like a circus ride. Now, do you want to equate a teenager talking back to a parent with being a homicidal maniac? Because that is the strongest evidence of aggression that they think they have in this case. I mean this admiringly. Leslie loves the spotlight. And in the closing argument, she had the spotlight and she was determined to milk it for every moment. I cannot show you the crime that Jose Menendez committed on him, but you heard about some of the things that he liked to do to his little boy. And one of them was to stick tacks like this in his thighs and in his butt and to run needles across his penis. The defense attorneys had given these, you know, extraordinarily theatrical closing arguments. Pam Bosanich didn't have a lot of theatrics. Don't assume that just because people have money, they can't be violent. I remember being really angry during my closing statement. And they bought the right ammunition. They bought the right guns. They killed their parents. Look at these defendants. Look at their crimes. Look at what Lyle Menendez has tried to sell you as a defense. Look at the lies that he has told you on the witness stand and ask yourself, can you believe anything that this man says? My hope was to m make the jury think they were liars. She stood up and just very quietly and strictly said to the, the jury, is like, this is a first degree murder. This is what they did to their mother. And don't let them get away with it. And she did that really well. Because the brothers have separate juries, the verdicts will not be announced until both have finished deliberations. The only question was how long the deliberations were going to take. It's really left for the jurors to determine the credibility and decide who they believe.
In 1993, the murder trials of Lyle and Eric Menendez captivated the country. TV networks were clamoring to get their Menendez made-for-TV movies ready to air once the verdicts were read. For six months, public opinion was divided between seeing the Menendez brothers as cold-blooded murderers or victims of unthinkable abuse. But what would each jury decide? So much had happened during the six months, I think, that this trial went on that it, would, it almost became like unclear what verdict the jury should come back with. The Menendez jurors were faced with five different choices. They could vote for first or second degree murder, voluntary or involuntary manslaughter, or acquittal. There was quite a bit of debate on uh, what was the level of the responsibility of the brothers. Deliberations began in December. At Court TV, we clearly kept viewers updated on what was going on, which was that nothing was going on. What does it say when the, when the, ver when the deliberations have gone on so many days that you're saying you still have a chance? They're still deliberating, aren't they? It seemed like an eternity because we were like, you know, on pins and needles. I was driving 30 miles to go sit in my office waiting. I actually brought in Needlepoint to help. Three weeks and they haven't budged. Uh, it has been our suspicion that there was some deep division. I guess this is as deep as it goes. The deliberations were taking a long time. The judge just kept telling them to go back and keep working on it. I did see during the trial that some of the men seemed to really have their minds made up all together. We were all given pads of paper to take notes of things that are important and things you want to remember and discuss. Early on, those pads of paper the men had were thrown on the floor under their feet. So it wasn't too difficult to assume how they were going to vote. And then in the middle of all the deliberations, we had the Northridge earthquake. The earthquake hit at 4.31 a.m. Pacific time. It measured 6.6 .6 on the Richter scale. This was a bomb. It went off under our complex, picked it up, and threw it back down 12 feet and crushed these first four apartments within four seconds. It was really, really scary for everyone. Several of you uh, sustained uh, property damage at your homes, dislocation because of the earthquake. We all want to determine whether or not the earthquake, its aftermath, is having any impact on where you can't form a unanimous uh, decision. So a lot of the jurors did have problems that they needed to attend to. So um, I don't think it helped the prosecution to have that earthquake at all. The court finds that uh, there is no reasonable probability of the jury reaching a unanimous decision in this case. Therefore, I find that the jury is hopelessly deadlocked and uh, the court declares a mistrial. It turns out that the verdict was that there was no verdict and in fact it was a hung jury. It was disheartening that it was a hung jury. Everybody wants to see an ending to a good story and there was no ending to this story. How deadlocked were they? Okay. How deadlocked do you have to be? <laughs> when I first heard the jury hung, I believed not necessarily that they bought into the theory of abuse, but that they were unsure. And you know what? If they were unsure, they should have hung. Let's just all thank our lucky stars they didn't acquit outright. One of the most interesting facts of the uh, jury deliberations is that all of the women jurors in the, both juries uh, in the first trial voted for manslaughter and all the men voted for murder. And when I interviewed jurors after the first trial, several of the men told me a father would never do that to his sons. Is it a victory? No, I don't consider it a victory. A victory would be if my client were free. To me, that would be a victory. I knew early on it was going to hang. And I was hoping it would hang and not be a not guilty. I didn't want them going home. The DA's office announced immediately that they were going to retry the brothers. We have an ethical, a professional, and moral responsibility to go forward with this case as a first-degree murder case. We're seeking justice, and that's what we're going to do. Gil was angry. They're better actors than even I thought they were if they're able to pull it off a second time. So imagine that you're Gil Garcetti, the L.A. County DA. You've got one huge high-profile trial that has kind of ended with egg on your face. And right after that, literally right after that, O.J. Simpson. 
O.J. Simpson is now one of our most wanted ever. It went through the interchange, continuing northbound on the 405. When the Bronco chase was being carried live on TV, Eric Menendez was watching uh, in his cell at the L.A. County Jail. And a few hours later, O.J. Simpson came walking down the hallway in handcuffs and shackles. And he was placed in a cell right next to Eric Menendez. A year after the hung jury, the L.A. District Attorney is preparing for the second, you know, take two of the Menendez brothers' trial. And a few days before that trial is set to begin, a verdict comes down in the O.J. Simpson case. The verdict is in. The Los Angeles jury found O.J. Simpson not guilty of the murders of Nicole Brown and Ronald Goldman. The O.J. Simpson verdict was yet another crushing loss for the L.A. District Attorney's Office. We are, all of us, profoundly disappointed with the verdict. I don't think anybody can question but that the DA's office needed a victory. You're talking about two first-degree murders of a mother and father committed by their children. And be damned with how much money it's going to cost. We're going to seek justice in this case. The public in the Menendez trial number two was in no mood to hear any excuses. Oh, my dad did this, boo-hoo-hoo. -hoo. They were like, uh-uh, we're done with that. And I think the OJ case had a lot to do with that. People were fed up fed up with people coming up with excuses for violent crimes. The pretrial publicity, the negative publicity, the fact that the Menendez brothers are a joke in this country, that's a problem. There's a bad, there's bad vibes out there towards them. We have now seen the defense take their best shot. We know exactly where they're going. There are no more surprises. It's round two for Los Angeles and the Menendez brothers. In the first trial, two juries, one for each of the brothers, hung, unable to choose between manslaughter and murder. We believe in our professional judgment, my professional judgment, the evidence warrants a conviction of murder in the first degree. Clear desperation for a conviction. Win one for the Gipper. The Gipper being District Attorney Gil Garcetti, whose office has been criticized for losing a string of high-profile cases recently, including that of rapper Snoop Doggy Dog, O.J. Simpson, and the original Menendez trials. So, yes, a win was desperately needed in the L.A. District Attorney's office. It wasn't an easy time in the DA's office. We were getting buffeted a lot. You read the stories that basically we couldn't win anything. Television. Yep. Like it, don't like it. Well, I love television, right? In the courtroom. No, I don't. And in Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the... The O.J. Simpson case had just ended. And um, one thing that came out of the O.J. Simpson case was that nobody wanted to put cameras in their courtroom again after that. The judge made a ruling a few weeks before the second trial started that he was not going to allow the camera in the courtroom. In order for TV stations to cover Menendez 2, they had to go old school and bring in a sketch artist. But the way it turned out is people were still wanting to hear every detail of this case. Mic check, 10, 9, 8, 7, And so every time there was a break in court, I would go outside on the courthouse steps and report live everything that happened in the courtroom. The prosecution is differing this time in that they are focusing so much on the really gruesome, ugly details of what two shotguns can do to two people. And the big, big, big change was that David Kahn took over as the prosecutor. This is a, a clear-cut case of first-degree murder, and we hope that we will convince a jury of that this time around. I thought, I'm not doing this trial again. I don't have to do this trial again. And so that's when I said, you know, I'd rather eat two ground glass for a year than try this case again. David was absolutely no nonsense. His idea from the get-go was facts, facts, facts. What happened here and who is responsible? The molestation began. He had the benefit of knowing what happened in the first trial. He just said that it was our secret to be able to craft what would happen in the second trial. Well, I think that we have now seen the defense take their best shot. We have the advantage of hindsight. We know exactly where they're going. There are no more surprises. Our starting point is that David and I never believed for a moment that they were abused. 
there is no medical evidence whatsoever to corroborate the claim of the defendants, that there are no eyewitnesses. So how can they really say that the defendants are telling the truth concerning the allegations? The facts were, when you look at them and you analyze them objectively, they don't support abuse. Allegations of abuse that deadlock the first juries are largely banned from the second trial. Much to my uh, shock, the second trial, the rules completely changed. All this information about the sexual abuse and the terror and sadism, the judge ruled was irrelevant. The judge just whittles away at our defense, makes it smaller and smaller and smaller. And this jury doesn't have as much information as the last jury's had. As a jury, you are stuck, for better or worse, with the testimony and with the evidence that you're allowed to see. I'm not able to make my decision based on facts that I couldn't see. David Kahn's plan in the second trial was to shut Leslie Abramson down at every turn. Major motions, objection. Minor motions, objection. What's taking place in the courtroom today was a clear effort on the part of the prosecution to prevent this jury from hearing the truth of Eric's life. Constant objection. He objected when there was anything that would show the brothers in sort of an innocent light. I objected because I don't think that the judge has to uh, allow a witness to cry as much as he wants to while everyone just sits in the courtroom waiting for him to stop. Such an obvious ploy that they're trying to dehumanize, um, you know, these brothers in order to desperately get a conviction. She was definitely cut off at every turn because by now the prosecutors knew that this was... Um, her strategy, and I think she felt like the judge wasn't fair to her. The same kind of objections were not made in the first trial by prosecutors who were far more mature and wise and experienced and professional than Mr. Khan is. But I think he's a punk. We were given the case to go back in the jury room and finally start to deliberate. It was on the eve of the verdict. They had almost all the votes in place. I said, well, it's later in the afternoon and the defendants would have to come back and the, all the attorneys, we could be here till 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night. So at that point, it was decided, okay, we'll finish up in the morning and see how it goes. The next morning, we show up and two of our fellow jurors were not there. The jury forewoman had a heart attack and another juror on that same night went into premature labor and we would have to begin deliberations all over. Eric did tell me that the stress of the trial was so severe that by the second time around, it was almost more than they can do. Nearly seven years after the murders and after two trials, news of potential closure came down. We got notice that there was a verdict. Everybody came out to hear what that verdict was gonna be because that would finally be the ending of the story. It's about to happen, it's about to happen. The new four person was sitting right next to me and I just remember his hands shaking um, when it came time. All the attention in the courtroom was on us. The jury has reached guilty verdicts on first-degree murder for both brothers for the charges of killing both their mother and their father. It wasn't going to be an undecided jury anymore. The jury has convicted the Menendez brothers of first-degree murder. They will spend the rest of their lives in prison. Uh, I really can't say. Excuse nice. us. It was good for morale, I will say that. We want justice to be done. The guilty verdicts were read uh, one by one, and there was absolute silence uh, throughout. Uh, Leslie Abramson was very silent. When the second jury came back guilty, I went into the dumper because they won, and I didn't, and it was hard. It was just personally very devastating. There was pathology in that household. Did Jose and Kitty deserve to be murdered for it? No, absolutely not. Did Eric and Lyle deserve to be sent to prison for it? Yes, absolutely. I'm not satisfied that the criminal justice system really did justice in this case, and that a lesser sentence would have been more appropriate. We 
did think there was psychological abuse to some extent. Yeah. Sexual abuse, I don't think we will ever know if that's true or not. It was also an area that did not necessarily have to be answered to reach a verdict. I have no doubts. I did my job with the evidence that we were allowed to consider. You know, I came to the right decision. Personally, I think it's a good thing we finally got a verdict in this case. I think that Leslie Abramson, in particular, on behalf of Eric Menendez, may have a pretty decent appellate argument uh, after the sentencing on the issue of whether the judge, in fact, cut her case or gutted her case. The legal part is over, uh, but the human part continues. As the years go by, I think of those guys in their 8 by 10 cells for the rest of their lives. What a waste. They had everything. The brothers asked to be sent to the same prison so they could be together, and the Beverly Hills police opposed that because they said they were co-conspirators and therefore they might uh, conspire to commit another crime. I have not spoken to Lyle in over 10 years. I, I have not seen him in over 10 years. The last time I saw Lyle, we were, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, and we were put in separate bands. The brothers are both in prison in California. They're in their 40s now, which is so hard to imagine because you think of them as the boys that they were portrayed as during the, the first trial. I was able to meet Eric in person when he was sentenced to Folsom. I don't even know how to explain what it was like. We were establishing a bond of some kind, which has continued all through these years. And our trial was over in 1994, so I'm talking about a lot of years. The interesting thing about Eric in prison is that he has really thrived. And he has become the person responsible for the prisoners that are working in the hospice unit. He's taking college courses, and he is getting straight A's. Lyle has had a more stormy course in prison. He can be arrogant, and he can be manipulative and uh, narcissistic, and he tends to alienate other prisoners. They've both married behind bars, although I don't believe they're allowed conjugal visits. Uh, I think Lyle has been married twice, actually. We're back with Eric Menendez and Tammy Menendez. They are uh, married, they are happily married. I can't see my life without Eric. He's my best friend and he's a really good person. Here, Tammy and I talk about what happened that night and I tell her everything. And she's, it's, her love has allowed me to, to really begin the, the long road to, to healing. At the end of it all, the Menendez brothers were sentenced both to life in prison, but Still today, questions remain about what their motive was and whether or not killing their parents was actually justified. Yes, I do. I heard iteration after iteration after iteration of their stories. And I went through believing them and not believing them. <laughs> I've never been able to come to my own conclusion about exactly why it happened. I always thought that Lyle was the uh, pathological problem. He was the older brother. He exerted incredible, if not undue, influence on his younger brother. Eric was probably smarter than Lyle, even though he didn't go to Princeton. Eric was more conniving. I feel like this was Lyle's show and Eric followed, and that's why he was more distraught the whole time. Do you ever regret what you did immensely so immensely so if he hadn't felt such guilt over what they did they probably wouldn't even be in prison today because no one would have known that they were the murderers they just did it because they were little bastards and greedy ones at that and not a day goes by when i don't wish i could undo this when i could bring them back uh, it's my unending regret, uh, and, and, in, and in a sense, it's my real prison. In 1999, citing the inability to present their full abuse defense in their second trial, Lyle and Eric Menendez challenged their life sentence convictions from prison. They lost in 2005 in the U.S. Court of Appeals. But now, a new California statute could possibly give Lyle and Eric one final chance at freedom. 
Penal Code 1473.5 cites jailed abuse victims who are unable to present their full defense can, quote, seek a new trial or a reduced sentence. The brothers have until January 1st, 2020 to file. I'm Hill Harper. Thanks for watching.